Okay. Your written presentation, it won't surprise you, um, relates to Bernie Madoff, Bernie L. Madoff Securities. And your job will be to come in just like you're a regulator, like you're from the SEC, the, Se the Securities and Exchange Commission, or you could be from any of the regulators, uh, the Federal Reserve, anybody. You come in, you take a look at what you see, you assess it, you try to see what's going on based on the information that's available. Then you make recommendations on what you would like to see to be able to manage an investment fund and minimize the operation losses. Um, Professor, um, is this an uh, individual presentation? Is it what? Is this individual? I, I missed the part. Was it individual or group? Individual. Individual, okay. Okay. You've got a week to do it and it won't take you a week. Mm -hmm. okay. Internal fraud is a le leading cause of operations and technology losses. Bernie was mostly about internal fraud. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like you to do is apply the concepts learned in the class to the Bernie Madoff case to develop an o and risk management program for not just Bernie, but for the investment advisory industry. Mm -hmm. Your presentation should include things like what internal fraud was Bernie committing? How did Bernie avoid detection? What risk management policies and processes could have surfaced Bernie's fraud? What would you recommend as a process for risk management at any investment fund? And then whatever else you wanna to add to your presentation that you think will be helpful. Uh, draw on what we discussed in class in your notes or from any of the required readings or any relevant information you may find on the internet. There's, there's tons of information about this case on the internet. On the Ponzi scheme, basically? Uh, about his Ponzi, Ponzi scheme and whatever else he was up to. You'll be able, you'll be able to get that on the, on the internet. If you can't just get it off the notes, I mean, I think the notes and the book are gonna be sufficient. Yeah. Uh, the notes go a long way. Uh, submit your presentation as a PowerPoint deck. Why do I want it as a PowerPoint deck? Because that's the only way you receive anything in business anymore, unless it's just an email, which has real limited functionality. People in business usually present PowerPoint decks. Bullet points are the preferred format. Not an essay, but bullet points. Any pictures or graphs that you want to include are encouraged. And you should limit your presentation to five pages. If you can get it done in less than five pages, that's fine. But I don't want to see decks come back with the smallest font possible so that I have to get a magnifying glass. Pretend that you are making this presentation to other regulators to say, here's what we found with Bernie. What would, should we be doing differently? And you have a week to do it. I, I, uh, I say a PowerPoint presentation, but you don't need to go overboard, overboard in formatting it. Um, the expression for that is, is that you want more steak than sizzle, if, if you know what I mean. You want to have some beef in there. 
But if you want to give it some sizzle by making the um, PowerPoint presentation look nicer, you can't lose. Whatever makes it easier and more legible, comprehensive for the reader to read. Okay. Questions, there must be questions. Professor, will we discuss the presentation in class? No, no, there, there we have 50 people here, so you're just gonna send it to me. Okay. You're gonna send, you. send it to me before class next week. If, if we had fewer people and we were all together in a classroom, it would be a group presentation. But I figured this is the only way we can really do it now without driving everybody crazy. And you would like us to email it to you, correct? Yeah, email me the PowerPoint deck before class next Thursday. Question. Um, do you want us to have like notes? Because obviously if things are in bullet, are you gonna like know that we were thorough enough or do you want us to like have notes or is it okay to just have the bullet points? Well, whatever you, Claire, whatever you need to communicate. It, you know what's great is if you can get a get the whole get the whole uh, thought out in a bullet. If you can't, okay. you might do the bullet, and you might have some verbiage in a smaller font font below it. But you know, I I sometimes put too many words on a slide, like the slide that I just told you about the written presentation. That's too many words for a slide. You know, I, I apologize for that, but you know, I wanted to get it in on one sheet so I can get that out tomorrow. So you all have a week to look at it or a week, <laughs> a couple of days to work, look at it and a week to get it done. So if you don't, if you haven't done PowerPoint presentations before, you need to, you need to learn how to do it something that you can just sort of speak off of. You won't be there to be able to speak off it, but I think you know what I'm talking about. It can't be an essay. Is, is that clear to everybody? Yes. This is not gonna be one where I, I am super picky on the way it looks. I just wanna get your, I just want you to get your thoughts out. Get your thoughts out in, in a legible way, in a way that I can read it. And you know, go through your no notes and hit the important parts. You don't have to include everything in your notes. I won't like that. You just have to include the relevant stuff. Don't throw everything. Don't throw the spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks, if you know what I mean. You have to just look at the relevant stuff that we've talked about in the class and use that on your presentation. Questions, any more questions? Professor, uh, can I ask a question about the final exam? Yeah. Um, is that gonna be similar in style to what we just took? It'll probably have an essay or two. Got it. Now, and there also be multiple choice or just an essay or two? Probably both. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Now, some of you are gonna have questions as you're doing this. Feel free to send me an email and I will try to answer your question. Okay. It may take me 24 hours to turn it around, but I will answer your question. If you're running out of time, don't wait for me, but you know, I, I think I can answer most of your questions. And how long is the final? The final is three hours. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, moving on. Today's agenda 
it's going to be a little drier. If you know what I mean, it's not going to be as exciting and thrilling as some of our other classes. So I can find it to just two hours, right? Take the class for an hour and I can find, can, can find this to just two hours. And I think we can get through this whole section. We'll talk about major business risks, key risk indicators, which are important, other indicators, risk and control self-assessments. As we are going through this today, please try to think how much of this would you use on your presentation? It's not for nothing that I'm going through this today. And it was deliberate that I made the presentation due next week because there are things in today's lecture that you may be able to use. Okay. We're gonna go through some, some numbers sort of today. So here's the inspirational words of Albert Einstein. Not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. You like that? That's why he was like the smartest guy ever. Um, our goal therefore is to find the important risk operations and technology data regarding risk and the design process and reporting which will mitigate those risks. Yeah, that'll, that'll be more clear as we go through the next slides. And this is something that I haven't said as much in this class as I normally do, but you can't manage a product or a business unless you can measure it. You have to have reports. You have to have numbers. You have to have numbers that you can compare to what your forecast was and figure out what the variance was. You have to have numbers to look at trend analysis. You can't just do it in a vacuum. So if you can't measure it with the numbers, you can't manage it. Here's our familiar page, and I've expanded it to include some major other risks. You have credit risk. That's the risk that a borrower doesn't pay you back. And it's not operations fault. It's the product design. Like maybe the loan was given to people that had credit scores that were too low. And you had a lot of people didn't pay you back and you have write-offs, that's a credit risk, okay? A market risk can be several things. It could be that you have uh, a product that you start marketing to your customers and you have uh, a wide open field to market it because you're the only one with the product. Say you're Citibank and you turn around six months later and Chase has the same product. So that's kind of one version of a market risk. It wasn't a credit risk, it was a market risk. Another potential market risk is, you know, the bank or Bernie Madoff may have a lot of securities in their portfolio, stocks and bonds. And something could happen that would decimate the value, the market value of their stocks and bonds. So that's a marketing risk. A liquidity risk is that, say, an entity can't come up with the cash, the cash that they need to run a product, right? They need cash to pay for vendors. They need cash to pay their employees. And if it's not coming off the products yet, if the product is not profitable, they need some other place to get cash. They need some other place to be liquid, to get liquid. Now in red, I have the risks more like what we've been talking about. We had the legal risk. Um, can somebody give me an example 
in what we've gone through, the cases we've gone through that had a significant legal risk. Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. They, they, they got sued by everybody. And, and we even saw that when we looked at their P&L, they had all sorts of expenses, but one that they broke out was operations losses. You can go back in the notes and you can see that. And they define that as a lot of legal expenses they had related to different ops losses. Um, sometimes it could have been uh, hiring and staffing being sued over that, uh, you know, which is another one of our ops risks. But Wells Fargo is a good case of a legal risk. How about a reputational risk? Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. Uh, what other what other uh, cases have we gone through? The, the Robinhood is kind of reputational risk as well. Say Robin, that again. Robinhood. Yeah. Think. Ro oh, Robinhood has a mm -hmm. Robinhood has a gigantic reputational risk. I'm not putting any money into Robinhood. What what else? What other case study had a reputational risk? Oh, uh, I forgot his name. I mean, that was the guy who was doing the trading to the bank. Bernie Madoff. Nick Leeson. Nick. Nick yeah. yeah. And then um, the next risk that I would talk about would be retention risk, which again, is not that relevant to the class. Not relevant like credit risk and marketing risk. Uh, liquidity risk, um, those other risks are not directly related to operations and neither is retention risk. And retention risk, um, the best way to describe it is if you sell a product to a customer and they're paying you a monthly membership fee, a lot of them will start canceling over time. So that is a retention risk. You need to retain, retain those customers. And then we have the ONT risks that we've talking about. So, you know, there's so many risks. It's a wonder that anybody does anything. Okay. Now that we have an understanding of ONT risk, we just went through that page, the previous page. How do we find it, measure it, and manage it? So we're going to get to some more concrete examples of risk. Now, again, as I said before, you can't manage it unless you can measure it. So I'm gonna give you now, I apologize, another busy chart, okay? And again, you have to be able to measure it to manage it. And these are key risk indicators. There are three of them. I see on the bottom here, I, should, I said, this page is your friend. Now, that corny little note there is me telling you, you might want to include this in your presentation. It's important. This page is your friend. I can't make it any clearer than that. Okay. So the three performance and in risk indicators that we have are key performance indicators, key control indicators, and exception monitoring. So let's go through them one at a time. A key performance indicator, indicator measures how well your operation is performing. Okay. Uh, for example, let's just say that you are writing loans, you're making loans to your customers and to process 
and approve a loan, it takes time. And that time that the loan is in the pipeline gets measured by aging, aging. If you can get an application for a loan today and turn it around in five minutes, it's not gonna be aging. If you have a loan that you've uh, got the information, the application for a week ago, and it's still in your pipeline, that would be aging, okay? That would be a serious aging problem that would appear to be a negative on your key performance indicators, okay? Another performance indicator that you'll, you'll recognize from any finance class you took is just the company's return on assets. How much are they making with the assets they have deployed? Are they making $10 on $100 worth of assets? Or to make $10, does it take $1,000 worth of assets? If it takes $1,000 worth of assets, the return on assets is gonna be much lower. So you look at that trend over time. Same with return on equity. We're gonna talk more about equity later, but you could look at that versus what your goal was. Say you had a 10% return on assets. So you could do a variance analysis on what you got instead of uh, what your goal was, what your benchmark was, and then have a time series. And then you can sort of see how you're doing against time. Key risk indicators. What would be a possible key risk indicator that was a key performance indicator for Bernie Madoff. Maybe that the returns were very high. The what? The returns were extremely high. Compared that's right, that, that's right. And somebody could look at that and say, that seems fishy or that doesn't smell right. What else could there be related to Bernie? Okay. Um, can, can I say probably um, the fact that um, only a certain class of people were invited to take part in his business activities? It wasn't open to everyone. I wouldn't take that as a key performance indicator. Uh, let's look at the other risk indicators and see if that is one. The, now that you bring it up, the fact that the uh, investment that he had wasn't open to everybody was not necessarily Bernie's fault. I think we talked about this, that to make a private equity investment, which is considered more risky than putting your money into a stock, you have, to, um, you have to verify on a document that you're a sophisticated investor. <laughs> and the way, it's, uh, the way an investor is, is defined is a sophisticated investor is I think you have to make a $200,000 a year and or you have to have a million bucks in, in assets. And the theory there is, is that if you lost all your money on the private equity investment, you'd still have enough to survive because you're pretty affluent. So Janelle, was that you that asked the question? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was me. Okay, so I, 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 I hear what you're asking but it's not really a key risk indicator because it's something that they had no choice over in selecting. Uh, in selecting. Well, uh, I, I don't know if it's related, but the fact that they, I guess just how the fund was, the fact that they could not 
get the money out for a certain period of time because they told them you could get higher returns. Besides the fact that return was kind of the same over time, but just the rules into it, basically. If someone was to look at and read all this and they'd be like, okay, why are they locking um, the why funds for a certain why, period of time? Why are they blocking redemptions? Yeah. Like if someone, you know, like would go and look it through and it would spot something. Yeah, I think if you had a, a time series data on uh, redemptions and you saw that they were either going down or they were going up, either way, that would tell you something about your risk. If redemptions were high, people were thinking that you were risky or your return wasn't sufficient and they get out. Um, if your redemptions are low, how is that a risk? I don't know. You're just piling up a lot of assets. And if the thing blows up on you, there's going to be some big numbers. But uh, why don't we move on to the next key risk indicator? And that would be a key control indicator. Okay. Um, for example, a mistakes, mistakes that your employees make indicate insufficient control. Uh, internal reports, external regulatory reports will address whether your operation is under control or not. Are you making a lot of mistakes? Is the process taking too long? Is the process too short and you're, you're making mistakes? Uh, another is the capital cushion that you have on the balance sheet. We won't talk about that right now. Just hold that in the parking lot because we have that in another lecture. But is key control indicators, um, is that, uh, uh, do you understand what I'm talking about there? Well, the key controls are the ones that they have the highest risk normally. Well, usually- Unlike the non-key ones. Yeah, a lot of times it'll be that a regulator comes in and says, uh, you don't have the control um, that, say for example, you need two people to approve a loan. Mm -hmm. And if you only have one, then you have a lack of control. Right now, okay, we did, we did, Bernie? We did credit protector. Uh, let's see, we did Nick Leeson. We did the bank life insurance. Um, international student loan. Price rewind. installment loan.
Did I ever show you the commercial we did for Price Rewind? Mm -mm. Okay, let's just do it now. Okay, we did Wells Fargo, and that'll be enough for today. You see my beautiful slides? Yours shouldn't look too different than this. Here would be an example of a picture if you wanted to do one. Okay. So. Okay. How about Bernie for key control indicators? What should he have had? What key controls Bernie had had no controls. He had no control. He needed internal reports, external regulatory reports. I, I think, uh, you know, uh, a reasonable conclusion is that he didn't have any controls. Um, we talked about credit protector. Yeah. Where, um, if a customer loses his job or becomes disabled, they get their credit card frozen and they don't have to pay us back until they get their job. So what could a key performance indicator be for credit protection? Uh, I guess the, the job, like the job verification, just so they're not applying and they're saying they have a temporary job two months, but then like they're not stable, that employment history. It feels, it feels a little more like that's a control indicator. I would say the amount of claims per month and on the base of the total consumers they have. That's right. That's right. I, I, I would look at a couple of things. You know, how many people are enrolling in the product, right? This is credit protector. If everybody's enrolling in the product, then you have to think, okay, well, there is some risk out there, but if everybody's enrolling in it, then you get a lot of good performers and some bad performers. So it, it shouldn't be, the, the losses shouldn't be that high. Now, conversely, if, if you only get a few people that sign up for it, you know they're the ones that are going to make a lot of claims. Otherwise, they wouldn't have signed up for it. So one of the things you would be looking at is how many people are signing up for it to get, a, get an assessment of what the risk is based on the profile of people signing up for it. And then a, a key performance indicator would be and how many people are making claims. A key control indicator would be how many people are making claims because, and getting paid because of mistakes. Uh, how many people are getting their account frozen who never really had a job? How many people are getting their account frozen because they, uh, they were never disabled and they're still getting their account frozen. So those would be control indicators if you could somehow assess what the volume of those things were. Um, What would be a, a key control indicator 
for the bank life insurance where we had all the claims that came from AIDS patients, what would be a control indicator there? Many they filed the claim, I guess, similar to this. Yeah, you have to say that again. Say so that again. Similar, similar to this, like how many they filed the claim then? Um, no. On, on that one, I would say there really were no controls. And that was the problem. I would go into that one saying they had a huge risk because they didn't have any controls. They weren't underwriting anybody. They weren't denying any kind of application because people were smokers. Uh, they didn't take any kind of physical. Somebody could have just had a stroke and they still get the life insurance. So I think for that product, the bank life insurance, the, con the key control indicators were very weak. Um, let's see. Let's see. Exception monitoring. Let's move on to exception monitoring. Uh, and a, a good example is that has the new product been launched with the proper approvals. It's exception monitoring is more often than not sort of a yes, no and answer. Uh, and that's why they have a binary outcome. It says, it says that before that um, exception monitoring. Um, what about the international student loan? exception monitoring after it was relaunched. It's either a yes or no answer when somebody is looking at the application. And if, it, if, if the application doesn't include this, it's an exception. Well, the, the, the second person, the co-signer? The co-signer. Mm. You either have the co-signer or you don't have the co-signer. So you could have 95 customers where you had a, a, a co-signer and five customers where you didn't have a co-signer. Mm -hmm. So you would be monitoring that and maybe putting a note somewhere why there was no uh, co-signer and why you approved it. So risk and risk indicators, you have three, the performance indicators. Is your product or your business going up or down on the returns on assets or equity. It could be anything. It could be, uh, it could be total uh, profitability. It could be your amount of revenue. Uh, lower or higher revenue could suggest something to you as a key performance indicator that would relate to risk. You just sort of have to think it through. Key control indicators, uh, you know, a lot of times re uh, regulators will come in and say, I want you to do this, that, and the other thing to get under control. So you do all those things. And then the regulators will come back and they see whether or not you've done those things. And if you haven't, there's exception monitoring. If you didn't implement all the key control indicators. So it works all sorts of different ways, but those are the key risk indicators Sometimes there's more than one. Sometimes there aren't any. But you need to look at Bernie Madoff and see what he had and what he didn't have that might have permitted somebody to see the scam, the Ponzi scheme that was going on. Well, he had something. He had a really good lock on 17th floor. He had that control on place. Yeah, he sure did. That access was so good. Yeah. Yeah, he sure I, did. He may be confused the controls and he said, let me put the lock on the door, so. Yeah, you know the expression I've, after that, I've heard it all. 
I really think after hearing the 17th floor and it being locked and nobody going down there, now I've heard it all. I just can't get over that. Okay, so to get a little drill down a little bit more, key performance indicators can be time she, period data. It was selling magic like <laughs> As interesting as this is, somebody needs to be moved. Yeah. Sounds like an old walkie talkie. Okay. So like we said, time series data. Can you hear me over this? No. So you can you can mute the person. You mute, yeah. Okay. Um, like in Bernie, with Bernie's case, did did he have any time series data on anything that we've looked at? Key performance indicators, key control indicators, exception monitoring. Was this the kind of thing that Bernie had? This would be very helpful for you. Mm -hmm. Now, no. all of these key risk indicators can be either lagging indicators or leading indicators. A lagging indicator tracks past activity and looks for trends over time. Okay. Uh, the, the, the limitation is that they can only show us what's happened in a lagging indicator. Uh, and, and, you know, a lagging indicator is not necessarily an indication of uh, future performance. So a lagging indicator is worth a lot, but it does have some limitations. Um, a leading indicator uh, of the best KR KRIs will be a leading indicator. Uh, if it if found in time, it can, it can really help you change the operation going forward. And uh, if, if you looked, if you did a survey of loan application files and the loan application files were missing cosigners or they were missing um, income, uh, assets, um, credit scores, if, if the files are missing those information, that kind of information, then that's a leading indicator that you have risk coming down your way. Uh, uh, but the lagging one was on the past to see what happened in the past, right? The lagging indicators show you what's happened in the past. Right, so, but if these applications were missing a signature that was application done in the past, or it's just kind of giving you a heads up what's actually the issue? I, I like that expression, it's a heads up. Okay. It, it's, it's more actionable because it tells you what you can do. Okay. Right? If you just look at lagging indicators, you know there's a problem, but it doesn't tell you as much about what you should be doing. Okay. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I've done this to the people that work for me. We've had one-on-one -on -one reviews and about their areas, I've in collaboration with the person that I'm talking to who works for me, we identify what all the good key risk indicators would be. And when I say we put it on a dashboard, it's really putting it on a PowerPoint slide or a piece of paper, what all the risk indicators are. And you need that to internalize really what they are. And so you can walk around to your group and say, here's a key risk indicator. How are you doing compared to that? I had people that would take their key risk indicators and take it to the uh, copy machine and keep copying it lower, 75%, 75%, 75% until they had something that was small enough that they could fit in their pocket, in their front pocket, and they could walk around with their key risk indicators. Okay, let's do a deep dive into them. Key risk indicators should be smart. 
That's the acronym. They should be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. Okay, so let's look at a key control indicator for Let's see, Wells Fargo. What would a specific key control indicator be? What about how many questions or how many uh, complaints you get from customers? Uh, measurable. What product are we looking at again? I forgot, I lost my train of thought. Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. Which one? Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. Oh, Wells Fargo. Yeah, sorry about that. What would be, so if you get a lot of phone calls from customers, that could be an indication that you've got some risk. Um, they've got to be measurable. So you've got to be able to set a target that says, I, I don't want any more than phone calls from 2% of the people that I open accounts for. It's a measurable uh, metric. And like I've said before, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So you'd be working against that 2% to see how you do the variance, explain the variance and do some time series. Attainable. Wells Fargo, should your K KRI, Keir risk indicator, an attainable one, would it be zero phone calls? Would it be zero defects? Probably not, because that wouldn't be attainable in any real world, situ real world situation. It's gotta be relevant. Uh, you know, what's relevant to Wells Fargo? Uh, well, what's irrelevant uh, to Wells Fargo? Um, irrelevant to Wells Fargo is uh, how the Yankees did last night. That's, a, that's an extreme example, but something that's totally irrelevant to your business. And uh, you have to get timely information so that it's actionable. So smart principles, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. Any questions about that? Okay. Key performance indicators. We talked about this one, cycle time. How long does it take to underwrite and approve and disperse funds? How long is, you know, that's basically how long is an application in the pipeline and how does it age? How long are they aging? The higher it's aging, the worse it is because you'll have customers fall out of the pipeline. The risk is you have customers fall out of the pipeline and go to uh, some other bank, Bank of America, to get their loan because of poor cycle time. Uh, you would use industry benchmarks as, a, as, a, as an important best practice. For example, what should the cycle time be for uh, a mortgage loan? Should that take two weeks to do? Should it take two months to do? You have to find industry benchmarks and compare yourself against those benchmarks. Are you getting closer? Are you below the benchmarks? Are you above the benchmarks? Those are all examples of key performance indicators. Other key performance indicators, customer support tickets. Um, do you get a bunch of those indicating that something is, uh, there's a problem somewhere? 
percentage of product defects. Okay, that, that could be coming back as I wanted a $10,000 loan and I get proceeds for a $100,000 loan. Like happy days, but I don't wanna pay back $100,000. And when that happened, do you see that as a leading indicator or a lagging indicator? Uh, like leading probably, so you can improve. Could it no. be, could it be lagging? Yeah, it happened in the past. Could it be both? It could be. To me, it sounds like both. But... Both is okay. Uh, and, and the efficiency measure is basically what we talked about before. You have to get industry benchmarks and um, measure your efficiency, your ability to process loans and how quickly and how accurately compare it to the industry. Um, some of the things you look at are, would be uh, the cost variance planned versus budget, schedule variance, are you running behind uh, planned hours of work versus actual situation? Do you have you staffed enough people or are you running a lot of overtime? Are you missing milestones to get something done? How much systems downtime is there? These are all things that you could look at as KPI examples. I don't see too many of these relevant to Bernie. These really aren't geared towards internal fraud as much. So, you know, the lesson for what I just said is not everything in all your notes is going to apply to Bernie. And if I get things in your presentations that don't apply to Bernie at all, I won't be happy. That makes me think you're just throwing everything out there to see what sticks. And then there's less intuitive KPIs. The employee turnover rate, the higher the turnover rate, the more mistakes are made. Uh, whether you can hire people, percentage of responses to open positions. Companies have risk now because people aren't applying for jobs because they're making as much or more money until recently uh, on the stimulus checks. So if you don't have adequate staffing, naturally that's a risk. Employee satisfaction replaced to the employee turnover rate. Uh, marketing forecast and actual volume. I'm just gonna get rid of that one. Okay. What do you do with the results of all these reports? Okay, and my, tint, my tip is, or hint is, you know, people are not writing these reports just for term papers, you know? They're not writing these reports just so they can say, okay, boss, I did it, now it's take it and stick it on your shelf, your shelf. What they're really used for, if necessary, if the indicators indicate that you need to fix a process, you fix the process. To do that, you recruit subject matter uh, experts. You may find something from your key risk indicators that, that indicates some risk, but you decide that that's a risk that you're willing to take, an operations risk that you're willing to take. You see on your K K KPIs that there's a problem, that you're doing worse than benchmark, that the trend in the time series, the trend is not your friend, but you can, uh, you can decide that that risk is worth taking because to uh, remediate that risk would be to, uh, it's more expensive than it's worth. If you did a cost benefit analysis, you would decide that it's not worth it. Uh, 
why don't we stop at this point and take a 10 minute break? So everybody come back at 8.15, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay.
Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to run out of time. So I'm going to push some of the material from this week to next week, which will be better for everybody because I'll compress some of the less interesting stuff next week and uh, teach some of the stuff from this week that we don't have time to do. Uh, where we left off, were uh, the key risk indicators. We did the key performance indicators, and now we're gonna look at key control indicators. Now, remember where this sits in the overall framework of the course. We spent a lot of time coming up with the categories of risk. Then we spent some time coming up with the sources of risk. And now what we're doing today is learning how to measure risk because if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So the next key risk indicator we have are uh, key control indicators. And we've talked about these uh, examples before. Did the underwriters do their jobs? The underwriters in the operation group have they determined that the customer has the willingness and the ability to repay a loan? That's, that's all what it comes down to in lending is does the borrower have the willingness and the ability to pay back the loan? And if in the operations team, they're not really addressing that specific question, then um, there could be a control issue. Same thing as if there's a, credit score that drives, determine who gets the loans or not. If the operations group is uh, ig ignoring the credit score, they could get late payments, they could get past due loans, they could get defaults. Uh, let's get rid of this. This is question is too esoteric. Okay, so again, if necessary, you fix the control item, you recruit subject matter experts, or you might, dis might discover that what you're doing is not that bad after all. So in a cost benefit analysis, you just leave it alone. Here's a really comprehensive list of key control indicators that you can go through uh, in your own time. But what I will say here is that this is a Bernie page. Uh, you know, how involved, was Bernie or how involved is Bernie L. Madoff Investment Securities in adhering to these and, and even acknowledging these key risk indicators, the key control indicators. Uh, then the last one is exception monitoring. Did the product team obtain all the necessary approvals before the launch? Uh, Oh, uh, let's not go through these now. We don't have time, but you can do this on your own time. Look at, think about these bullets here and think about KRI examples that uh, might be relevant. On this page, you might wanna look at it for the final exam. Um, other key control indicators um, uh, and uh, other metrics for just uh, key risk indicators are the frequency of regulatory reviews. If you get a lot of them, that indicates a problem. The length of overdue responses, if there are any fines, uh, key risk indicators. There's technology and infrastructure metrics. And we haven't spent a lot on this, but if you were to uh, partner with another company and say that you were doing something for them that needed IT systems, 
then that company may come in and do due diligence and to make sure that your control environment is adequate. They could be looking at your system capacity, the system backup facility tests, network downtime, help desk calls, breaches of security. So to illustrate what a vendor may be asking for, or a client may be asking for, I'm gonna use the example of True Credit. True Credit uh, was owned by Lehman Brothers, the now defunct Lehman Brothers. They made investment, an investment in a credit monitoring startup in 1998. Okay, so that was in the nascent early days of credit monitoring. It was a technology company. And the idea was to do um, programming for other companies. An example would be, I was in the home equity business at Citibank, I was the CFO. And we wanted to have a website for people to be able to apply for their home equity loans. Back in 1998, people were still using dial up to get onto the internet. You, you may not remember this, but you would go through AOL and it would be, be a noise, so you, burr, 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 that kind of thing. And you'd be on the phone with AOL you'd, via, you'd be on the internet via AOL, which was using your phone. So if somebody came to the Citibank website and they wanted to open up a home equity loan, then all they got was a phone number. If you want a home equity loan, dial this number and somebody will talk to you, which meant that the potential customer had to log out in order to be able to use his phone, his or her phone, because they had been using that for the internet. Okay, so we in the home equity business said, that's not good, we wanna be one of the first places out there where you can apply for a loan online. So we went around finding people who could do it. We went to Citibank and asked their technology people, is there any way you could do this for us? And the answers we got were, well, we're not sure. If you wanna do it, it'll take about a year and it'll cost like $10 million. And so we knew we would never get approval for something like that. So we almost forgot about it until we went to a technology convention, me and the guy who ran the business, we were at a technology convention at the Javits Center in New York. And when you go to these conventions, there's people with all sorts of booths out there, booths, you know, that um, they're trying to sell you their product. And my boss and I went past one booth that talked about this uh, true credit company. And they said that they could basically build a website for uh, online applications because they had access to credit monitoring data. They had a license to get the credit monitoring data from the companies that provide it. So they were in an especially good position because they had that data and had access to that data. So if they built a website for somebody, they would be able to use that data which would put them head and shoulders above everybody else, okay? In terms of a, a, a website where you could either be approved or denied for a loan. You just put the information out there uh, on the website and it pulls your credit report, asks you a couple of questions and you would get your answer. Um, Lehman Brothers liked what we, oh, oh, oh. The other thing was is that they told us they could get it done in three months for $500,000 instead of a year for like $10 million. So the people at Citibank were very wary of true credit. It was in San Luis Obispo, California, 
which is a beach town uh, best known for its surfing. And we had a lot of surfers on staff and they would have these crazy hours. They'd have to go whenever this uh, surf was up. So uh, it, it made things interesting, but they were the greatest programmers that I've ever worked with, these surfers. The only thing they didn't understand was they didn't know anything about the home equity business. So we had a symbiotic relationship. They would do the programming and we would teach them the home equity business. So boom, all of a sudden we had this um, application that we could sell to other banks where they could use this, this application to uh, take loan applications and review them and approve them or deny them on the website. So we were peddling this around to different potential clients and they were asking, one of the big things they were asking for was a continuity of business plan. What if we went down? How were Citibank customers going to be able to um, apply for home equity loans if we went down? Um, so our backup plan included a second site where we had all the mainframe computers so that if the first site went down, we would be able to use this backup site. And it was only five miles away, so the employees could go back and forth to the, to the backup site and the main site. So it sounds pretty robust. What could poss robust. What could possibly go wrong with that plan? Well, the answer is San Luis Obispo is in the earthquake zone. And it's right next to a nuclear power plant. A single earthquake could knock out the primary facility and the secondary facility. So that wasn't too cool with the customers, customers that we were trying to get. Um, so Lehman signed off on everything we did. Lehman had a very bad, bad control environment. And that's why they melted down in 2008 and went out of business. Um, okay, so that's the story of True Credit. The, we also need to talk about risk control self-assessments. And this is where the people of all levels, the three lines of defense, work on questions that they can ask about the business, pointed smart questions, smart, actionable, whatever those acronyms were, attainable. And they have a questionnaire to go from business unit to business unit to assess the control environment. And the people in the business assess it themselves and then run it up the ladder so that the, uh, the corporate second line of defense can take a look at it. And then even farther up to that than that, the auditors can take a look at it. Um, there's a lot of pre-work that has to be done before you have one of these risk assessments. You have to identify the executive sponsors. You need somebody who's an executive vice president to lead this and ask for it, or it will never get done. It's not the kind of thing that directly generates revenue. It just potentially saves you from an operations loss. So unless it generates revenue, sometimes things don't get the focus that they should be getting. Uh, you need to dem therefore you need to demonstrate that there is a, uh, a the cost benefit analysis of the risk management effort is worth it. And you establish a risk committee or a chief risk officer to coordinate the certain activities of risk functions, and that can be at the business level and the second line of defense, usually both. Uh, <laughs> you have to have a common language. 
uh, you would say that there is a risk of something, not that the wheels will fall off, something like that. It can't be too folksy. It's got to appear very serious. Uh, you have to establish people ownerships for particular risks or responses, or everybody's going to be pointing the fingers at everybody else for the risk assessment. You need to develop action plans to ensure that these risks that you've identified are appropriately managed. You need to develop consolidating reporting for the various stakeholders. And we'll go through what a stakeholder, who the stakeholders are. And then let next, and then you monitor the results of monitoring the results of actions taken to mitigate the risks. Uh, the stakeholders here that rely on the RCSAs are the owners of the business. Uh, and that could be uh, shareholders of the business, the employees of the business themselves, the customers of the business, the regulators, and the overall economy. You can't do anything that's going to blow up the overall economy. So these are sort of the buckets that you look at with your RCSAs. How do they affect these? One, two, three, four, five different groups, four different groups in the overall economy risk. So that helps you put things into a framework of where the risk actually is and uh, who it re would really impact. Uh, It has to be transparent. Uh, people need to be upfront and transparent about all of their risks. Um, this is where you get to the question about if there is a risk, an operations risk, and there's a problem anyway, there's kind of, there's an ops loss problem. Where do you put it? Where do you put that expense? Say you have an expense for overtime because you didn't properly staff up. Okay. If you're a senior management in the, biz in the business, senior manager, you can spend your time working on RCSAs, but it's not gonna be a priority for most people in the business. What they focus on are sales and earnings. So, if you're in operations and you're an operations risk, you have to fight for the mind share of the rest of the business. Remember we said early on that operations uh, risk management is sort of like the bass in the background of the music. You don't always hear it, but you miss it if it's not there. And that's the same thing with the operations uh, risk management. You may never see it because these people are sort of buried and they don't get the same attention as the people that are bringing in the sales and the earnings. But uh, you know they need to be there anyway, or there's going to be a problem. The uh, RCSA people have to be there anyway, or there's going to be a problem. You don't know them. You don't see them if everything's going right. You only see them and hear from them if something is going wrong. And senior management wants to limit the noise in the business. They don't want to publicize that they have any problems. And a lot of times a business is split between the front office and the back office. And the front office would be marketing, product development, um, credit policy, and the back office is operations. So let's just say that you manage the front office and you have high credit losses. That manager is going to try to convince financial control to book that loss as an operations loss because then the front end manager completely gets out from under it and it appears as if the, process, the problem in the process relates to the back office, somebody else's uh, bailiwick, somebody else's business. So RCA best practices, you interview the, pers uh, the people beforehand to ensure.
to ensure that the RCA is well designed, our CSA is well designed, and it's really relevant to the business. Uh, a questionnaire based RS, or RS, or CSA is valuable because it kind of standardizes things. You can go between the business, go between the student loan business, go between the mortgage business and ask them the same kind of questions because they do have similar buildings, businesses with similar risks and that way you can standardize the RCSA process. The problem with that is, is that sometimes uh, you can't do that. A business has its own specific issues that you have to make RCSAs for. And trying to put together two businesses that are dissimilar results in trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Uh, if you've ever heard that expression before, if not, you should look it up on the internet. Uh, The, you know, you should have some flexibility because you may have two different businesses, but it can result in inconsistencies in risk and controls. And your RCSAs have to be actionable, not just sitting in a binder on a shelf to collect dust. I've done RCSAs many times and I've taken them to the business manager. And half the time the business manager has taken it and put it on a shelf. They didn't even ask to go through it with me. Other times I go through every page, I go through every word and a business manager will make changes depending on what they discover that's actionable. <clears throat> okay. And then responses could be, and we, we gave an example of this before, if you find a risk, say in Florida, you could say, I don't wanna do any business in Florida. That's risk avoidance. And that's the less optimal one. That's the less op optimal uh, strategy. The more optimal strategy is to try to reduce risks to a level that you can, that you can absorb it reduce the likelihood or the impact related to those risks in Florida, rather than just blow off the state altogether. Um, when, when there is something that you find in the RCSA, you identify it and you need to schedule a date for completion, fixing the item in the RCSA then more often than not, you're not done on time. So you need to get a revised completion date. And then you get the completion and you sign it up. Here is an example of uh, an RCSA report that I saw for the mortgage business. The first problem was application volume is not appropriately staffed. Okay, so then what we did is we came up with daily and weekly and monthly volume reports to see if there was any kind of seasonality or how tied the, uh, the number of people, employees we needed to the volume of the business. And there would be a due date for that when you get that done. We talked about this before, the, through the RCSA, you may have discovered that applications spend too much time in processing. So the corrective action is to come up with aging reports. So you can see what percentage of your loans are 10 to 20 days in the pipeline. How many are 20 to 30 days? How many there are 30 to 40? And you can see where you have a problem and where you need to put in some kind of mitigation. Uh, I've had one that said that credit losses are not being addressed by senior management. And the corrective action was to get operations people to actually look at the credit scores before they approve or decline a loan. And the last one I have li listed here that we got were high credit losses were not being addressed by management. So that all went to the collections department. We find a lot of people that are becoming delinquent. They're not paying their loans. The question is, 
Now, what are you doing? What's the corrective action? Are you getting involved earlier? Are you calling the borrower when they get a little bit late? When they're looking like they'll never be able to pay you back, do you start looking at the property and see how you can foreclose on the property and get your money back that way? So again, these are real life examples of what came up in an RSCA, RCSA report that I looked at and was involved with and the correction at, uh, actions that were uh, associated with it. Any questions on the RCSAs? Okay. This was a big problem that I have. I thought that there was some uh, overreach. At times, um, risk managers would even come and question the value of the cust uh, the value of the product to the customer, which is way out of their charter. They should have been looking for risks in the product, not whether the product had a lot of value for the customer. It's better left to the subject matter experts. Okay, I do have a little bit of time, so I'm gonna go through another uh, uh, case study that talks about key control indicators. And this one was at Citi. Um, when Citi first merged with the Traveler's Life Insurance Company in 1998, it was the first time that a bank was able to take deposits, make loans, the traditional banking stuff, and then also buy and sell securities for customers. That was new. And that was something that was viewed as too risky for a bank that might put the customer's deposits at risk. But 1998, banks got the approval to, to uh, buy and sell securities. One other thing that banks got approval for in 1998 was they got approval to underwrite insurance. So they could sell you a car loan. And if you crash your car, then the bank was on the hook to give you whatever it was, the replacement cost. And again, it was something that previously had been viewed as insurance is risky. So we don't wanna add that risk on top of the risk that already exists in banking. Um, Buying and selling securities is risky. We don't want to add those on to uh, what's already a, a risky banking situation. But what happened in 1998? President Clinton uh, decided that all of those restrictions were too broad and they limited the amount of business that banks could really do. So he repealed it. By 2009, those bold predictions of Citi's group's success had turned to ashes. The banks um, became, the bank basically became too big to manage, right? You have a senior management team and you have a board of directors. And if you're lucky, if you're Citibank, you can get a management team and a board of directors that knows something about banking. But how are you gonna find a board of directors that knows something about banking and something about insurance? You know something about both of them. Or how do you find a board of directors that knows something about all three of them? Insurance, banking, and selling and buying securities. It just became too far flung and impossible for anybody to manage. Um, they, um, Citibank ignored a lot of their policies and procedures, both with, in terms of credit policy and managing applications as they came in. The business was just flying in after the three businesses got together and essentially the business had to cut corners. Uh, the business, had, uh, because there were so many far-flung enterprises, 
the regulators asked the bank to send in mystery shoppers to monitor performance at City Financials, which was a subsidiary of, of City Financials employees. So how does that work? Let's just say I'm a mystery shopper. I go into a Citibank branch and I ask to uh, open a checking account. And if they open a checking account, fine, that's great. But if they say before I can leave, hey, you know, we can also look at, you know, you may want a mortgage, look at our mortgage products, or I can open this account for you, or maybe you need a credit card, blah, blah, blah. If I found that as a mystery shopper, I might report back, you know, they're really alienating our customers. They're putting too much of a hard sell on. But Citigroup undermined the effectiveness of that monitoring by giving advance warning to city financials regional managers about upcoming visits by mystery shoppers. Great, huh? How can, what kind of a control environment is that? Can you even believe that something like that is happening in big businesses? Just like in Russia, it happens everywhere. <laughs> but it shouldn't, but it does. Uh, and here's some more examples uh, that the regulators alleged that city did in Japan. Uh, they allowed the clients to engage in money laundering. Uh, they failed to perform background checks on new clients to ensure that they weren't criminals. That's pretty basic. Uh, they misrepresented the risks of complex structured inv investments sold to clients. And they failed to safeguard the confidentiality of client information. And many, you know, they asked a lot of questions. Regulators came in, Citibank came in. There were RCSAs. There was all of that. The problem with Japan is that the employees were not very forthcoming with the problems. They tended to, uh, you know, shut their mouths and not tell the regulators and Citibank about all these risks. These are one, two, three, four major risks. And there should have been people blowing the whistle on, but it just never happened. A regulator in Japan noticed that, uh, noted that the main reason for the problems was, was that salaries and performance evaluations were closely linked to sales targets. And that's a very, very slippery slope. Remember back at Wells Fargo, it was sales targets that got them in all sorts of trouble. People were opening bogus checking accounts just to meet their sales targets. Uh, and that happened through the whole company. It was all about new businesses, new products, new customers, and con a control environment around all that sort of took the back seat. Um, Citibank was cutting corners on underwriting mortgages. They, they asked a third party to come in and audit their mortgage files, this Clayton Holdings, and they rejected 42% of the subprime mortgages that it reviewed between January 2006 and June 2007 because these loans did not meet Citigroup's underwriting guidelines. 5%, 10%, no. 42% of the loans did not meet Citigroup's underwriting guidelines. So what do you do? I mean, if, if there's a blow up there, do you blame credit policy? Probably not. The, what's happening is the operations group is not doing what they're supposed to be doing when they're looking at a customer and whether to approve or to decline the loan. That, that rests primarily with operations. Uh, they cut costs. Uh, your big banks and enterprises all over the place, if they miss their numbers, they have to talk about something that they can do right away to the security analysts and stockholders to improve their profitability. 
And if you're the CEO of the company and says, we're going to improve profitability by making more, more loans, it's quite possible that people will be skeptical. But if you turn around and say, we're going to improve profitability by firing 50,000 people, well, that's pretty easy to look at the salary line and see how much that's going to save you and what's that going to do to the bottom line. But what happens often is not enough attention is paid to what that's going to do to your operations. As you can see in the picture, this guy is just like totally overworked. And when that happens, mistakes are made. So that's another ops loss, not adequately staffing for the amount of work. Um, but that the, the amount of work sometimes to avoid, they just, companies, what they, I guess they're doing is that on the peak season, they're just hiring these consultants and they're covering that for like two, three months. And then they're, like technically they're not covering the work, they're just covering that uh, to go on with the controls, I feel. And then they let them again go and then it's back to the normal, to the full-time people, so. Just... Yeah, what we tried to do in the student loan business, because there was such seasonality in, in, in the work, because you would get a lot of applications for student loans in August when students were supposed to go back to school and you would get student loan applications in December of the second semester. But September, October, November, all the other months, people had a lot of time on their hands. So for those months, we had those people uh, working on credit card applications for mm -hmm. the months. That, uh, that they didn't have a lot to do in student loans. So we were so able to offset a lot of that seasonality yeah. to keep people employed. Um, the regulators who found that C the Citibank's risk manage management system was inadequate is that they thought that the risk management group had insufficient authority. And that's true. They take a, a backseat to the people that bring in the, re, uh, bring in the revenue. Uh, Citigroup decided that of the three lines of defense, the first line, the business unit, possessed too much power. And more of the oversight and management needed to go to the second and third lines of defense. And city didn't do a, comp a com comprehensive fir firm-wide consolidated stress test. And we're gonna talk about what stress tests are in, in the next lecture. So I'll get hung up on it. Uh, this talks about more about the bank was just too big to manage. Um, And here was a mistake that the bank got, did, because there just wasn't enough manpower to do things. At one point, and you can look at the chart later, Citibank was the vendor that paid Revlon's creditors their interest payments. Revlon had interest payments to their creditors they would send City a check and City would disperse all the money to the creditors. That was the instructions. The execution, there was a little bit of a glitch. One day City didn't send just the interest to the creditors, but sent back all the principal to the creditors as well. Big mistake. These creditors are wondering why I'm getting all this money from Revlon through Citibank. It was a major blunder. And a lot of the creditors didn't want to send the money back. And after all, it was their money initially. It was supposed to be paid back by Revlon, but Revlon wasn't doing well. Their financials weren't good. So when Citi accidentally sent them not just the interest, but the principal back, 
the, uh, the lenders were going, yeah, psych, that's great. They got their money back. So it became a big thing about how Citibank as a fiduciary could have done that, what their responsibility for doing that and not doing that was, and what kind of operations process didn't, uh, risk management process didn't exist that would permit something like this to happen. Uh, they only got 385 million of the 900 million erroneously paid by city. Uh, and we just talked about this, the litigation continues about that. Because of that, Citibank got a lot of press. This is September 14th, 2020, not that long ago. So the regulators reprimanded Citi for failing to approve their risk systems. And boom, somebody paid the price. Their CEO, Mike Corbett, paid the price for having inadequate controls but as we all know, it was a far flung operation and Citibank had been trying to get rid of those businesses, get rid of the insurance business, get rid of the, uh, the stock sales and trading. And for the most part, they had been able to shed most of those businesses, but still there was some legacy parts of those businesses around and they weren't adequately managed from a risk management perspective. The regulators told Citibank before that they had to get their act together. Citibank did not get their act together. So Mike Corbett had to retire. Now the guy was 60 years old. He probably should have retired, retired anyway. But um, it was the CEO of a major international bank was shown the door because of inadequate risk management controls. Why is school retirement though? Say that again? Why is school retirement? The guy clearly failed to do his job and he was kind of like let go, right? But why retirement? That's just what they do. That's just Fancy they, word? That, that's just what they say. So they don't um, embarrass the guy too they much. They didn't want to, okay, got it. Embarrass the person too much. But like we were saying again in the first class, Sometimes risk management doesn't get the attention it deserves. It's not on the forefront. It's not new sales or new revenue. But this in the background, risk management was in the background. It didn't get enough, enough attention and it cost this guy his job or sent him into early retirement. Okay, that's all we have for this class. Uh, next week, you turn in your written presentation to me. If you have any questions, uh, specific questions, send me your emails. What I, what I prefer that you don't do is send me a draft of what you have to take a look at it. Uh, but if you have specific questions, I'll be happy to look at them for you or address them for you. Okay, it was a big class. You had a quiz. We went through a lot. It's 8.58. Unless you have any questions, I'll cut everybody loose. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. You're welcome. Thank you, Professor. Have a good night. And thank you. Thank you, Professor. Adios.